perspectives on energy, and that is oil prices these days. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, this is ThinkTech, and more specifically, this is perspective on energy. And we have Guillermo Sabatier, uh, and we have James Stanton to help us understand what is going on in the global oil markets and how Ukraine has affected the global oil markets and how those markets are going to affect us. So get your pens and pencils out. Uh, and your credit card too, by the way, because you're gonna. This is going to affect you in your credit card. <laughs> hey, so welcome to the show, Guillermo and James. It's nice to see you here. Appreciate you coming on, Guillermo. Why don't you take it from here and, and help us understand? Thank you, thank you, Jay, for that warm intro, and it's great to be back. Uh, I missed a week a couple of weeks ago, so it's uh, good to be back. Uh, and then today we have James Stanton, of course, the director of advisory service at HSI. And uh, thank you for, for joining us today as well. So we really appreciate your input and also your, your, your help us answer a few questions as far as what we're looking at. So uh, facing what we've got going on these last several weeks, you know, it's, as I'm sure everybody's well aware, we, we got quite the uh, global crisis uh, with the invasion of Ukraine and all of the issues that, that spun out of that, right? And one of the things that we're looking at is, is now it's, it's uh, Russia being a big uh, oil producer and most of the world ended up being dependent on that, on that supply of oil. Uh, now that we're not buying, most of us aren't buying oil from Russia anymore, it's certainly changed the, the, the uh, spot price in the, on the market for, for fuel, for oil and petroleum products. So how does that impact uh, utilities that are smaller islands like Hawaii or US Virgin Islands or any like the Caribbean or other islands in the Pacific that mostly rely on diesel for their generation? I mean, they're, they're, they make great, great strides towards the um, process of, of, of becoming independent and also having 100% renewables. Most of them are not quite there yet, right? So uh, one of the things we wanted to talk about today was, was just... Um, how how that particular challenge is is, is facing the uh, ratepayers in Hawaii, and uh, one of those things you might see, and, and you may not have seen the effect just yet on your energy bills because uh, you know it's, it's been less than a month, right? That this all happens. So, as the um, most utilities have uh, that pass through fuel charge, and you may see that as well in your fuel, in your uh, electric utility bills once you get them. So uh, we're here to discuss may, um, what we're looking at as far as the next couple of weeks, the next couple of months, really. Hopefully the situation get back under control. Uh, maybe we'll find some other sources of, of petroleum or production steps up. But in reality, while Hawaii is still highly dependent on imported uh, petroleum products for their electric portfolio, they're, they're gonna be subject to these fluctuations. Now, uh, one thing I was going to refer to Jim on that is, is, is we, we had something similar happen. It, there, there are parallels to the mainland. The one thing was Hawaii. I mean, it was uh, ERCOT, which is Texas. And they themselves are, are a smaller interconnection compared to the other two. And they had a fuel supply issue. They had a uh, freeze issue. And see if, if Jim can tell us a little bit more about that, if you would, please. Sure, Guillermo. Happy to weigh in. And it's a good point you made about the energy prices and the spot prices um, here in Texas. We have well, thousands of producing oil and gas wells here in the state. And our prices are just the same as other folks because it's all based on that index price on the spot market. So just having thousands of oil wells nearby is no um, guarantee that you're going to be insulated from these fluctuations. So that's one thing. And you're right. I mean, in, in February of last year, we had a, a cold um, wave come through Texas, which was really unusual and caused some freezing problems, especially for fossil fuel generators, coal generators, gas generators. And it also froze up some of the gas lines supplying those generators. So it was sort of a double whammy. And um, it, was, it was a big wake up call. And we even had a couple of hundred people die in the state from cold exposure and thousands and thousands of homes with the pipes burst, froze and burst. And so now the steps are being taken at the Public Utility Commission here in Texas and even on a wider scale with NERC, the North American Electric Liability Council, to put in place some measures 
not only to take steps to preserve the integrity of generation in extreme weather, but also to come up with some uh, more farm fuel type products and mm -hmm. options that generators can take. So that's two things that are going on right now. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jim. And, and uh, there, there, there's several options, right? Uh, uh, some that are, that are in effect right now, for example, HECO has a performance-based regulation that just came into effect uh, late last year, and, and it's 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 definitely a great thing. It's it li it aligns more with what the mainland practices are when it comes to its paper performance. Really, when it comes to the the how the utility performs, right? It's no longer a cost-based uh, billing; it'll be more like a performance-based billing. So so. And a little bit of profit sharing, and that's great for the utility, for the customers, the utility, and all around the progress made uh, towards that renewable goal. But but even then, may, that may not so soften the immediate blow when it comes to these pass through fuel charges, right? When, especially with, with you know the majority of the portfolio is diesel. So. Um, in in the near term, some of the things that the the, the items may be looking at really is, is uh, from from what I can see is perhaps uh, expanding the uh, storage options, whether it's uh, existing batteries, uh, some of them are lithium based, or some some other uh, potential chemistry. Uh, in the next show, uh, actually, the guest is going to be the senior VP of uh, Energy Storage Solution, uh, no, Energy Storage Systems. I'm sorry. Uh, Hugh McDermott, and he will be talking about about that particular option. But in reality, th these uh, energy storage is, is indeed a, a really effective uh, complement to the uh, variability of wind and solar, right? But even then, that's not enough to to make it to to that 100% renewable goal. And you still have to complement that with something else. And geothermal seems to be a really really promising resource in in Hawaii. Uh, of course, that isn't without its controversy, right? The, the 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 Puna facility had shut down back in 2018. It's back on as of June 2021, producing 40 megawatts. They can produce a whole lot more, but then again, that will be more than what the island consumes, right? So so and that will be a single source supplier. Um, challenge there will of course be being building other other facilities and the rest of the islands and maybe interconnecting them so along with that a a, a submarine uh, transmission cable or a series of cables would certainly be the answer but of course that also isn't without its controversy so that that in itself now there are definite benefits right to being interconnected and the whole reason for example the mainland has the eastern interconnection the Western has with well, the Western interconnection, and even ERCOT uh, on its own has its own interconnection that connects to either one through these small uh, these DC ties that, that are rather limited. But even then, they're able to rely on each other for some mutual aid whenever there's an issue. So the way the islands are now, it's they're basically just these, these microgrids com compared to to what we see here that are highly susceptible to disturbances, right? And not to mention the fact that they're also uh, it, they have to rely on this expensive generation to be able to handle the uh, the dispatch and the swings. Now, um, given that, right? It's it's, uh, and I want to ask Jay in, in this particular question. So, so, Jay, what is the appetite for for these uh, submarine transmission cables to interconnect the islands? I remember there was a project years ago that died. There was a project again when NextEra Energy tried to acquire Hico. And that was one of the things they had on the table, and that, that also kind of like uh, there 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 was a lot of obstacles with that, and understandably so. So, what will be the appetite now for something like that? Mm. Not much appetite. No. Uh, this is um, you know this was a controversy. I don't know if it works this way politically, socially, industrial, and the main culturally too. I think so. You know what what happens is you have a big controversy. Uh, activists come in, or you know, there'll be lawsuits and a lot of media coverage. Um, and then, if the activists win, and the project is stopped, which is what right. happened here, um, it becomes radioactive. Uh, and for the future, um, nobody can get up to it. No, nobody can sidle up to it. Nobody can support it because it's been radioactive. Uh, mm -hmm. And it takes years, decades, a half-life, if you will, 
um, to get that project going again, and sometimes never. Uh, so I think I would put um, Undersea Cable, which you know we supported, and a lot of people who appeared on our Think Tech shows supported this project. Um, but there were there was opposition to the extent that stopped it, and um, I don't think it's going to start again in the near term. Yes. I mean, there, there's definitely work to do there, right? And 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 really, it's 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 a it's a lot of uh, from what I've seen, it, it could strongly be a perception issue, and that and that's that's never an easy thing. I mean, we, uh, there there are other examples where it's successful, like the Trans Bay Cable in San Francisco, California. There's another one that connects, for example, the UK to France. I mean, it's many many cables, Norway, as for the thing. So, so that you know that they, they and there's a lot of the communications cables that that interconnect all the islands already, right? So, so it, it it's really the perception of, of of laying yet another another set of cables between the islands that, that definitely gets people around. Though, but uh, you know, there's always the the upside, right? Where where it's it's it'll you have a greater greater reliability. You'll be able to meet your renewable goals a lot a lot sooner, and then of course is the ultimate um, the ultimate uh, benchmark of of having prices from from kilowatt hour is significantly reduced, right? And and that, that that's definitely a difficult thing to balance, right? I think. And and looking at that challenge, it's 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 I still think that's a challenge that the islands would, would would benefit them greatly to re-examine and look at again at some point uh, with with uh with oh, I agree with you absolutely because it is yeah. obviously a, an efficient solution. Yeah it would create a statewide grid. It would mean sustainability and resilience for the system. Um, it would save us in times of, um, you know, natural disaster or otherwise. And so we really ought to look at it again. Yeah. It, and, and, and along with that, is, it's, it's the same level of controversy, right? When you look at, for example, geothermals such as Puna or even in the other islands, right? It's really difficult to get uh, those projects at a, at, a, um, at a capitalized cost scale that, that, that makes it worthwhile, right? If, if, if you build it too small, it, it's almost not worth it, right? Building it too big, then you just can't, you can't put those megawatts, uh, you got nowhere to put all those megawatts, right? So, so, so it's, it's finding that, that sweet spot of the size of the facility that'll definitely make it worthwhile. And, and uh, aside from the economic aspects of it, it's just uh, something, of course, to get, to get it approved, uh, that's another challenge. Uh, as well, right? So, so in Hawaii, all projects uh, go through the gauntlet, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes it, it takes so long to get to the end of the gauntlet that they give up. Many times. Give up, yeah. Well, well it, it's it, it's definitely a challenge. Which, which I mean, the way it's set up now, really, is it's even. Uh, uh, even throwing up a, a so solar arrays right out there to just reduce the cost of, of what they're paying ultimately is is a matter of um, it also has its 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 controversies too because because now you're 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 placing these facilities you know in potentially sensitive areas and then you only have a certain uh, certain geographical spots actually that, that are favorable for for that solar array so then you have that controversy and then. Uh, even battery storage itself, right? It's a lot of it currently is is not very cost effective. They have a very limited number of, of cycles. Um, there there is new technology, and that, that that whole iron flow chemistry that we'll talk about in the next show uh, see, look, looks to be very promising, uh, very cost effective, uh, highly reliable, and and it's it's a lot far more far safer than than the existing options right now so that may be something that's a savorable it may serve as a as a good interim solution or or something to add to the mix but it's still not without its challenges right these things are the size of shipping containers and and so you begin to throw those next to like a wind farm or a substation or any other generating facility to augment the capability of these places and before you know it right it, it begins to look like a like a seaport, you know, with a lot of these. So, uh, so hopefully, my next show, the the guests I'm going to have will, will be able to clarify and show what what it is that that they 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 provide. But uh, it may be a good option for the island to, to look at. But at the same time, you know, it's these things. I mean, they they're we, we all have these goals of 100 percent renewable by a certain. I think it's 2035 or 2040 for for Hawaii. 2040. 2040, right? So, so that is uh, actually 2045. 2045. Really, two goals. One is 2040. One is 2045. <laughs>
So, and, and those, you know, as 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 we come come across these challenges and things that that we come on the way, I mean, it, it's the other thing that the Hawaii has to deal with, of course, is is the uh, the issues with uh, weather, right? Uh, Jim and I are both very familiar with hurricanes. Uh, me being in Florida him, and he being in Texas, you know, we see that quite a bit. So that's another aspect, right? That eventually has an impact on your bill as well, right? So, so uh, getting ready for that. And, and, and uh, in Florida, for example, a lot of it is natural gas. So we're constantly, so, so all we see is, is the majority of our portfolio is natural gas. Whereas in Texas, it's, it's got a greater variety of sources, right? Mm-hmm. But I can just imagine with, with Hawaii, it's, it, it being mostly diesel fuel that's imported because there's also no drilling anywhere near, near Hawaii from what I imagine, right? So that definitely has an impact. So, so um, where, where we are, uh, Guillermo, is in uh, solar and batteries, um, you know, for single family homes and maybe some condos uh, right. are coming into, you know, play. And the, the the regulators are allowing that. The uh, utility companies are yeah. encouraging that. Uh, Kauai is largely solar. Uh, Oahu, not so much, but getting there. And the Big Island, yes. And you know, if you if you look at the the mix right, in uh, the portfolio, if you will, mm-hmm. um, it's 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 weighted to solar in terms of the renewables, and it will probably increase in solar. Which makes uh, geothermal uh, a big of a, a bit of an issue, right. because if you rely on geothermal and then for some reason there's another eruption, who knows what, mm-hmm. uh, then then you don't have a backup on it. But I think that's where it's going. And I would really be interested in hearing from you guys about you know the vision you would have, including an undersea cable uh, for Hawaii. What should we be focusing on? Where, where should we put our in what basket should we put our eggs? Um, what should we spend our money on, and and how can we get there? Oh, well, I've done a lot of talking. I'm gonna let, let Jim answer that one first, and don't mean to put him on the spot, but uh, go no, ahead. <laughs> no problem. Um, just just from what I've heard and what I've learned, when uh, Jim asked me to get involved with this, the the undersea cable seems to be the like the engineering slam dunk for a lot of the issues um, about building generation, capitalizing on capacity, sharing back and forth, increasing reliability. Um, we, we're kind of an island here where I live in ERCOT in Texas. It's, it's a big island with about 75,000 megawatt peak load, but we are not connected to the rest of the uh, mainland except through some DC ties. And those are mainly to help shave peak um, demand that we share back and forth um, with the eastern and western interconnections. Um, barring the um, slam dunk of the cable, probably the stories that uh, Guillermo talked about, and I think you're going to go into a little bit more next week, that does a lot of things. Um, you can build the generation even above the capacity of your load and store it. Mm-hmm. And and schedule the um, you know the discharge at nighttime, daytime, whatever it gives you a lot of flexibility. And uh, at least in our business, and we help people integrate their resources into the grid and help them with some regulatory issues. Probably ninety percent of our business in the past two months, new business has been battery storage um, customers getting set up just in the county that i live in here in texas there are eight projects currently under development are these utility projects or um community projects or individual projects independent power producers Mm -hmm. and a lot of them are coupled with either an existing or a solar facility co-located so like we'd be standalone batteries or they can be co-located with a, a solar or a wind facility. And so to help them manage their dispatch and be more available around the clock. And it takes care of that um, to a certain degree, it takes care of that variability, which has always been kind of the issue with renewables, whether it's wind or solar. But I mean, it's just, it's going crazy um, here. You know, battery storage is, it's not coming, it's here. And right. it's getting bigger every day. Does that does that mean you don't need to be concerned about interconnection with, uh, you know, outside of the immediate grid? 
because uh, I, I remember that in the in the Texas um, you know, uh, blackout, what a year ago was it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the big uh, issues was uh, not being connected, uh, not having the infrastructure to connect to other grids elsewhere, other states, what have you. Um, you know, I, I certainly agree that we could use an undersea cable, but uh, it seems to me that the technology may be going to smaller grids that are not necessarily interconnected, but, but that are more resilient. Your thoughts? No, I think that's true as well. I, I, I do think the the initial slam dunk would be the cable, but yeah, but with the introduction of the batteries and the the higher flexibility you have in dispatch, it does make the microgrids more capable. Um, so to speak. So you're not, you're the risk of being exposed to that variability goes down a lot. And it's just defining where that kind of critical point is to saying, mm -hmm. okay, we feel like we're pretty independent right now, given, you know, natural disasters and so forth. But for the most part, um, I don't know that it's going to take that long to get to that point for some smaller type entities, microgrids, and so forth, if they can get these batteries up and running. And like I said, they're they're being built like crazy here. Will we, if we in ERCOT ever get to that point? Um, for the most part, blackouts for us are at the distribution level and are a result of hurricanes. It has nothing to do with generation. It has nothing to do with transmission. It has to do with trees falling on power lines. Right. You know, a year, a year or two ago when Maria, did I tell you about this, Guillermo, uh, when Go Maria came around to Puerto Rico? Yes. Um, yes. There, there were these huge um, uh, uh, solar farms. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them were built with a certain kind of fastener and others were built with another kind of fastener. And I suppose um, one of them was built with a more expensive fastener and Another was built with a less expensive fashion. <laughs> and, and after the, uh, you know, the storm hit, uh, they noticed that the ones with the better fasteners stood, stood in place. Right. They were not destroyed. The ones with the lesser fasteners were completely wiped out, destroyed, yep. had to be redone. And so, you know, to the extent of making a microgrid in Texas or elsewhere, um, you know, that was stand up against, you know, storms. And certainly Hawaii right. has that risk. Um, you really have to use the best, most, most uh, sustainable, most, you know, resilient uh, infrastructure that you can possibly find. Uh, if there's anything short of that, you, you're exposed. Well, not only that, though, a lot of those facilities in Puerto Rico, the, uh, a lot of the, the, the distributed energy resources that were on rooftop solar, uh, a lot of those weren't really built up to code. So, so, so they blew off. And in Florida, for example, uh, you want to throw panels up in your roof. It's, it requires a permanent inspection and that, you know, it's, it's a licensed installer and that sort of thing because of the fact that, you know, if you're not careful, you're, you're, you're putting a giant sail on your roof that can not, not only get ripped off, but then potentially rip off your roof along with it, right? So because of the, the hurricanes. So I'm sure Hawaii has the same challenge, right? Um, and, and, and given that, right, it's, it's uh, ultimately when it comes to utility scale solar, right, that, that's one thing that the utility dispatches. But when it comes to distributed energy resources, which is a customer having their own solar and even battery storage at their homes, now not only are they, they're, they're, they're very micro, tiny micro or nano grid, you know, if you'll call it, but they also have the ability to, to be dispatchable for the utilities. Which now means that they can work in synergy with the with the utility to to provide power or store power or even be available for the utility during times of uh, of shortages, which you know everybody wins. I mean, the utility avoids having to build the power plants or new transmission lines, and the customer you know has is, is obvious benefits as well. So, but then again, that requires a lot of a lot of new additional regulation that now will penetrate into the distribution side. And, and that's uh, qu quite a bit of what, what, uh, what Jim dipped those into is the, regula the regulatory advisory services, right? And, and what we're seeing now is, is FERC is expanding its, its, uh, its uh, scope of, uh, of, of compliance, you know, further and further into distribution. And we'll see that quite a bit uh, in the few coming years. It, it, it's going to be more, more apparent, right, that they're, they're, they're subject to these uh, regulations even more. Yeah. Well, I think um, 
we need more energy. We need cheaper energy around the country if we're going to rebuild our manufacturing base and uh, improve our economy. And so, you know, where utilities used to be, remember the day when utilities were a, a, a grandmother stock? <laughs> you bought yep. a utility stock and, and oh, yeah. flipped coupons and it, mm -hmm. it earned, you know, a point and a half or something, you know? Long-term yeah. investment, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that's not so anymore. It's a very important industry um, and it's uh, connected at the hip with our economic future. Absolutely. And it's going undergoing a lot of changes, quite a lot of changes. Yeah, to say nothing of all the technological changes. Oh yeah. But the this uh, the thing with the oil now that is going to let's assume, you know, these sanctions stay in place. Let's assume that Europe just stays in a coalition and they're not going to buy Russian energy. Um, but but of course, uh, oil is fungible. Mm -hmm. and you don't know exactly how the oil is getting into the system. Right. It could be getting in through the stock the spot market in any number of ways, and and Russia can sell the oil. Um, I I don't know where this market is going to go. Where do you think this market is going to go, and and what effect is this market going to have? A on gas prices over the next six months, and B, what effect is it going to have on national policy over renewables? Right. Well, uh, if I may, it, it's I think it's gonna it's going to. Uh, force the current administration to revisit what their policies are on oil. Uh, hopefully, I think coming out of all this, I mean, there's going to be a, a, a greater balanced approach. Uh, it's, yes, still still work towards a renewable goal, but at the same time, it have a balanced approach, right? It, it's, it's you, there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of blaming, of course, on both sides, right? So where, where one attacks the industry, the other one attacks, you know, it's, it's a foreign powers. But the truth is, it, it's it, there. there's a better way to handle this on both sides, right? And it really is a balanced approach. And it may require a little bit more production on our side, right? So be, be, uh, so, so the U.S. becomes another net exporter of energy. And uh, you know, while in the meantime, right, we, we still, you know, this this will stay fresh in our minds, right? This vulnerability of being subject to, to another country's whims that has an impact on all of our economies and all of our security. Right. So I think this will change things, hopefully in a positive way. That's my naive perspective, I think. I hope, I hope not. But but it's, it's definitely a place that I think we're going to be headed to. And, uh, and I'm, I'm anxious to see what will happen in November. Right. Because that, that's going to be the midterm elections. And that, that will definitely have an impact on, on, on what what the result of that will be. So I think I think before then we'll make some changes because it will be important enough based on that. And. I think we'll, we'll come out of this in a few months. I think a whole lot better, I hope. Jim? <laughs> no, I, I agree. And, and uh, as Jay mentioned, it's the interconnectedness of this worldwide market for oil. You can't just point to one place and say, that's the reason, that's, the, the, that's where the spot price is, that's where the scarcity is, that's where the transportation pinch is. It, it's too big and it's too interconnected uh, worldwide for that. So. I think it's going to be a global response, um, whether it's increased production coupled with a decrease in demand. I mean, that's the two sides of the coin. And so looking forward to seeing that happen, um, hopefully in the next four to five months. See, I, I noticed that here, our gas price went down a dime a gallon from yesterday. So right. maybe it's starting to go the right way. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, uh, Quick, quick story. Uh, uh, um, my wife and I bought a bought a Tesla Model Three, the cheapest Tesla you can get, right? We bought it back in January because we were like uh, 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 traumatized by the fuel prices back in November, right? So we bought it in January. We got to monitor how much it costs to fuel to, to power that thing up, and, and and we we did a hypothetical of what that would be, would be costing us today, and it would justify, you know. It's just amazing the 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 savings, right? Just on just on fuel alone, right? So that makes such a difference. I mean, but at the same time, now the, the cost of a Tesla has, has gone up at, at least 10%, they say. So supply and demand changes everything. Should I buy an electric car, Guillermo? <laughs> you know, I uh, there's a strong indication that I think it might be a good idea at, at some point. <laughs> as long as you, you don't go on long yet, trips. Jim? <laughs> Just don't go on long trips. Range anxiety still drives me crazy. <laughs> 
Well, we're almost out of time. Let me ask you guys to, um, you know, uh, tell our viewers uh, your takeaway, what you want to leave with them today about oil prices and utility bills and, and where they are and what affects them and uh, how, how people in general around the country will be affected. Uh, James, why don't you go first? Okay, thanks, Jay. Um, I, I think it's encouraging that there are some levers to pull as far as innovation is concerned with the um, oil consumption, with the way utilities um, operate, the um, resources that are available to them are continuing to evolve and become more efficient and more widespread. So I'm optimistic about the future. Like I said, there, there are just more options to explore now than there were 10 years ago. And I think it's going to be an exciting time in the next few years. Absolutely. In so many ways. Guillermo, what, what would you like to leave with people? Well, I, I, I think Jim, Jim put it best. And what I'll add to that is I think this may, this may accelerate certain changes while at the same time uh, re, uh, refocusing the balanced approach, right, towards the renewable energies goal. And, and uh, you know, there, there are places where, where, where people may have to you know, take a second look, a more objective look, for example, at the submarine cable or even the geothermal resources in Hawaii, right, for example. And then there's other things here in Florida, for example, we're far too dependent on natural gas when it comes to generation. So more diversity there is, 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 is called for. So. The, the, Are we in a position, Guillermo, to sell natural gas to Europe to replace? We have been already. Ah, we already have been. <laughs> yeah, How do we get and, it and over they, there. Yeah, they they liquefy, put it in ships, and ship it over. There. Ah, okay, okay. All right, great discussion, uh, Guillermo Sabache, uh, James Stanton, uh, Guillermo with HSI in Florida, and James with HSI in Texas. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thanks for having us. Aloha.